So good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to the best free entertainment on the whole web, the RSM's In Conversation series. Now then, tonight, I, uh, my guest today is someone who I think I can say is quite unique. Actually, you can't be quite unique, can you? You're either unique or you're not. Two is unique. He's both the captain of England cricket team, or indeed any sporting team, I believe, who's also been president of the British Psychoanalytic Society. It can only be one person. It is, of course, Mike Really. Mike, welcome very, very good to see you uh, and welcome and, and thanks for joining us. Now then, Mike, tell us to start off. Now, looking on Wikipedia, you, your occupation is given as cricketer, but in numerical terms, you, you've actually been an analyst for longer than you were a cricketer, but like it or not, you're ever going to be described as a cricketer. Does, does that ever bother you? It did. Uh, it bothered me when I first um, started training in psychoanalysis, which was really just, just at the end and towards the end of my cricket time and afterwards. And I really didn't want to be known as the cricketer, you know. I wanted to be become known as the psychoanalyst. And uh, so for some time there was a sort of tension and there's always been in my life a bit of tension, not always, but for a lot, many decades, there's been a bit of tension between the body and the mind, you know, and... Uh, playing uh, games and doing sort of stuff that's supposed to be intellectual or whatever. And um, I think the last few years I've spent quite a bit of time in some of my writing, for example, in trying to bring these things together. Okay. Uh, especially cricket and psychoanalysis, but other things too. Okay, and uh, I accept that. And we, we definitely, we promised you that we're not going to talk about cricket the whole time, uh, far from it. But nevertheless, like it or not, you know, you have the fortune, good fortune or bad fortune, I don't know, but you, you're not just being defined by being a cricketer, but you've been defined by one particular period of, of, of your life, obviously the summer of 81. And I want to talk a little bit about that. But, but first of all, let's just go back a bit earlier. I mean, you, you were a very precocious talent, weren't you? You captain Cambridge, um, et cetera, et cetera. You were a wisdom cricket of the year and all, and all of that. How, how did that come about? I mean, as long as you can remember, did you want to be a cricketer or was it something? Yes, that, yes. When yeah. I was nine, my mother said to me, if you go on like this, you'll do nothing in your life except play cricket and football. And she was <laughs> half, half, half true, you see what I mean, not the football. Yeah. But my father was a very good, he was a Yorkshireman, very good sportsman, a very good cricketer, amateur uh, and a school teacher. And um, so, you know, he was my first hero. And then Middlesex heroes, Jack Robertson, even the head of Dennis Compton and Bill Edrich, but Middlesex mm -hmm. and then England. And so I, yes, and I could play cricket, obviously. And, and um, I don't know if I had concrete aspirations. I imagined, fantasized playing for England, as many, many kids do. Um, but I don't know that I quite, in fact, I think I might have been a bit better as a player if I'd had a, a more um, firmly formed ambition. <laughs> and of course you were, oh, what's the point, you were a serious student. I mean, you went to Cambridge, um, you read classics, you got a first, and, and did you, get a, you got a first in classics and something in moral philosophy. I've forgotten which way around it was, but you, yeah, that way you certainly, you didn't have, you know, a cricketing third or, or a, a no. It was called at that time. So you were always to track. But I've, I've got a, I found a picture of you from your early days when you went to uh, Middlesex, Captain Middlesex. And it's an amazing, it's a shame I should have shown it actually, but it's a, a everyone's in suits and, and looking, you know, rather more, less form, more formally with today. And, and you're, you're on one side of you is Fred Titmus and then Peter Parfit and JT Murray. And you're looking distinctly unhappy. It was in Cricket Monthly a few, a few months ago. And uh, you're, you're definitely not looking happy and you're not looking relaxed. And according to the article, that was partly to do with the people I've just mentioned. So how was that the period of your life then when you, when you went well, into professional cricket? You see, I, went, I, I had a year, and a, a year and a half of professional cricket when I was 22, 23. And then mm -hmm. I made one of those decisions between these kinds of things. And instead of continuing in professional cricket, I went back to Cambridge to try and do a PhD, which I actually never finished. But at the, after that, I, uh, I taught philosophy at Newcastle University. So I didn't play much cricket, 
really for about five or six years from 23 to 29. I mean, I did play a bit in the holidays. I played in the Northumberland League on a Saturday <laughs> when I was in Newcastle. I played for Cambridgeshire when I was at Cambridge for a year or two, but I didn't play regular professional cricket. So it didn't, I don't think that did my batting a great deal of good. So the time you're talking about, it might have been 1964 when I went on a tour, the MCC tour of South Africa was a young hope for, um, uh, and all of those players were on that tour. Middlesex players, or it might have been oh. when I was captain in the uh, in my late twenties or early thirties, and it wasn't. I, I think easy. I think it's when you'd just come as captain. Mm. Well, it wasn't altogether easy the first two or three years, partly because, with some cause, you know, there, there's all the old stuff left over from professionals and amateurs, gentlemen and players, and. Somebody when on the committee at Middlesex, when I came back to play as captain, said, of course, you must have a private income. Now, I didn't, <laughs> my father was a Yorkshire school teacher. I didn't have a private income um, uh, and would never have conceived of it. But the idea was, you see, that people like us, you see, that's the point, would, would expect much more than people like them. And, uh, and I think that sort of message was still around very strongly in the early 70s. I mean, the actual official distinction had finished in 1962, but um, <clears throat> still in the 70s it was there. And I think there was a feeling that I wouldn't have been captain if I hadn't been at Cambridge or had the right accent or something like that. And I could understand something of that, you know, there, there was some cause for it. Probably I was a bit arrogant too, but there was also a cause for it socially in more general terms. So I didn't find it easy. Um, John Murray, for example, um, had been vice captain under, under uh, Fred Titmus and then under Peter Parfit. So he didn't, never had a chance to captain. The other two had been captains for three or four, three years each, I think. So, and I was this part-timer who was being almost uh, sort of um, helicoptered in. So I can see, that, you know, for various reasons, there was some cause for it. But there was also the atmosphere in the side at the time that if you hadn't played cricket for England and hadn't been a capped Middlesex player for 10 years, you should keep quiet. You know, and I didn't like that attitude and I tried to change it. So there, was, there were various things, you know, this kind going on. But I also very much respected those three players. Uh, I was fond of them too, uh, though it was difficult. Okay. Yeah. And of course, you were successful. You led Middlesex to four, five championships, I think, or quite yeah. a few. Four. Yeah. Four. Four, yeah. right. Yeah. And you were, you know, Wisdom Cricket of the Year, and you had a first class triple century to your name, which is unusual. You're in a still a very small class of people to do that. And of course, started playing for England. But if we get to, you know, the, what, what might call the kind of I mean, it's not the climax of your life, but but the, the bit for which you're ever going to be famous. Do you uh, you 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 you'd stopped playing for England? Yes, and, a year before. Uh, yes. So we're in in, in in 1980, and then of course life changes. So I just want to set the scene a little bit for you to set the scene, just so we can remember how long ago this was, because it's mm. the 40th anniversary. Mm. How did you learn that you were going to be captain? How did the message get to you? Well, I. I think that it was this occasion when Alec Bedser, who was chairman of selectors, rang me up and, uh, and uh, from the public call box and he couldn't get the money into the, into the thing. And <laughs> <laughs> eventually I had to ring him back. And, and there'd been speculation because Ian Botham had retired, or not, not retired, resigned, I think before being kicked out as captain, mm -hmm. but there was a lot of speculation. Even some people thought he shouldn't play. Uh, uh, there were other people mentioned Keith Fletcher, me. I can't, I can't, can't remember who else. I think Raymond Illingworth thought he had a chance, but actually, even he was, even he was a bit too old for that. He was fifty, I think, at the time. Um, so it, it wasn't completely out of the blue. Um, and I'd scored some runs for Middlesex. I'd scored four centuries in the season up to whenever it was, end of June. And so I was pretty excited <laughs> and nervous. 
And Alec wanted me to be captain for four matches. There were four, four matches of the series left, and I suggested that yep. we should make it three because, uh, you know, if things went wrong, they would want somebody else in before the tour. So that was how I found out. About I mean, the point that just pe people of our age will, will know what you mean, but I just want to, for others who probably have no idea what a call box is, no idea what the slot was. And I think it was a reverse charge call, wasn't it? It was a reverse charge call. Would I pay for the, yeah. the operator? Yes. Yeah, so, so right. There are three things that if my kids are, are listening, they have no idea what we're talking about. It was that far ago. So Sorry, just, you're, you're completely right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, Yeah. I know. It's great, isn't it? But, yeah. Yeah. And, and what, more, what you had to put in was four pennies, four old pennies. Uh, which were the size, yeah. you know, which were about, I don't know, about the size of a sort of George the Third crown. Well, your, 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 your family <laughs> don't probably remember that either. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. there were a few things. You had to put them in and press button A. Yeah. Was it, I thought it was B. It was B. One gave you your money well, back. B was to get your money it. back, wasn't it? Oh, it was B to through. give you money back. Okay. Right. That's anyway. right. That's it. B, yes. You had to press button A. Ah, delightful, delightful. Okay. So, anyway. But the end result, of course, is you become captain and the series is in a desperate way and uh, your first match is at Headingley. Now, I, I, I was going to ask listeners to see that if they can think of any question that's never been asked before about this, yes. I promise I will ask you, okay? But I want to start with one that I can't find anyone's asked before, but we'll see. Uh, uh, but um, let's try and be a little bit different. And this is this is the end of day one. It's not gone well. I can't remember what the score was, but Aussies are already on top. And and you, I've read somewhere you called your analyst at the end of the first day, but you've never said um, for advice. But you never said what he or she said to you. I presume they didn't say you know slips are standing too close or or anything. No, she didn't. Or something. Uh, no, she didn't say. What what advice did you get? Well, you see, it, this touches on the whole question of advice and psychoanalysis, right. doesn't it, and counselling and all of that, and the difference between yep. advice and, and interpretation or, or uh, uh, therapy. Um, and, I, 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 and the answer is I don't exactly remember, but what I took from it was that she said two things, and she probably put them in the form of a sort of comment rather than a piece of advice, but, the, but you could take them both as pieces of advice. And one of them was, um, you don't, even if things have gone badly and you think you've chosen the wrong team and uh, uh, you should have chosen a different team and now they're 210 for three on a pitch where you could get bowled out for 90. Um, uh, even though that's the case, uh, you, you seem to feel that you're bearing the whole responsibility for it on your shoulders as if you are the only one. In other words, if you put that in advice terms, it was, don't think you're so important, you know, it's, it's all right, you, you've done your best and it would probably uh, have gone just as badly if you'd done the other thing, <laughs> was more or less the comment. Um, now what was okay. that? I thought there was another thing, but it's gone out of my, it's gone out of my head, it'll come back. Okay, well, we'll get the second one as well. Yeah. Now then, David Friedman, I vaguely know, is... Uh, pointed out that uh, all our memories are fading because by 81, they were spring-loaded, uh, the, the phone boxes. And of course, they've been decimalized already. So they are couldn't, they? you know, uh, yeah, oh. yeah, well, I'm sure he's right. Oh, well. It's always right. Oh, well. I know, that's it, isn't it? Memory's awful. But anyway, nevertheless, yes. it was a reverse charge call yes, and it was. was from a phone box. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, thought, right. I thought that was too. Yeah. Oh, that's dear, right. David is a killjoy. Yeah. Um, well. But it... But then again, I mean, my kids have, don't know how to use a phone, to be honest, if it's not, if it's not, you know, if you give them a handset with a dial, they, they, they look at you like it's prehistoric. No, no. So um, the point is still the same. So the, the, the match, the, the match goes, goes on and, and, it, and it obviously it's become completely iconic. And I want to quote to you uh, what you then said later, much later, looking back on it, and, and this was talking to Atherton in the Sunday Times on the anniversary, and, and you said that uh, obviously these events had allowed you to dine out on those events for life. But then you, you went on to say um, that, that, um, that, it, it, that since then it said that you, it, it allowed the myth to be enlarged and to give space for the myth to form, you said, um, after that. Uh, what did you mean by myth? This is specifically yeah. talking about heading the 81. 
Well, I mean, the myth was, well, it was rather, it sounds arrogant, but it was rather nicely put by a Guardian writer. I don't, I think it was at the Oval, who said, you know, who is this man? Um, I'm sure he looked up towards the sun and asked it to move <laughs> a little squarer. <laughs> that the myth. Yeah. The myth is of a magician, you know, at least um, I think that's what the myth was. And, and I think the less I did in cricket and the less I did for some years after that, to have any kind to do with cricket, except in 82, where I played again uh, for Middlesex, um, well, uh, this sort of expanded. And, uh, you know, what do you do with it? You just say, well, it's a nice myth. <laughs> well, especially in the opposite. Well, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, exactly. It is a nice myth. And it's, I'm not saying it's... Got, I'm not saying it's got nothing in it. I'm just saying it is a myth. And, and the other thing that I said to Mike Atherton and said many times before is quoting Ray Ellingworth, who said, I was the luckiest captain ever. And, and I was very lucky. I mean, there was the amount of luck in that, in that match and the next one, and even Old Trafford, the third one, which we won, mm. it was huge. And all three of them could well have gone the other way easily. In fact, most likely would have done most often, whatever anyone had done by the end. But, that, but that's the case with all, all sporting events, isn't it? I mean, with, well, with this... no, there are sometimes you have no. a better side and you play better than the other side and you consistently do that. You know, uh, I mean, it's not always like that. I mean, those were matches where we were in terrible, terrible position at Headingley, yes. following on that, and behind with seven wickets down. And in, in the next match, all they needed at Edgebuston was 150 on a good pitch, still a quite a good pitch, uh, with the sun beating down, and you know there were no there were, there were no pitfalls in the pitch really. So mm. both of those things were won by very narrow margins after five days. One by 18 runs, or was it 19, and the other by 29, I think. And in the last yeah. one, in the second one, but Ian Botham took five for one. Yeah. And the last six wickets for almost nothing. So uh, there was a lot of luck. Mm. There was a bit of luck that Bob Willis played at all, wasn't there? In the, yes, in there was the that too. The most famous. That's true. You want to just mention that a little bit? Why, why, why that was luck? Yes, he had a chest infection and he hadn't been bowling very well. He'd been bowling lots of no balls. He'd lost his uh, sort of main striker role a bit to Graham Dilly and was wondering whether he should cut down his speed and try and be sort of fast medium bowler rather than out and out fast bowler. Um, he'd lost a lot of confidence actually and we thought he was not fit and we didn't pick him for the match at, at um, Headingley. And then luckily before the invitations went out, um, uh, the selection committee were learnt, I think we did say we would check up before that went out, but uh, mm -hmm. they, no, he was, he was fit and we said, well, all right, he's got to play in a second 11 match, there was a second 11 match for Warwickshire on the Monday and Tuesday. This would have been on the Friday night, the selection committee, uh, for the next Thursday. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, he, he got through that. He bowled in the nets for a good period of time and he was fully fit for the match. So he played. But it was that close to him not playing. Yeah. And his life, like your life and like all of the, the people mm -hmm. in that uh, class of 81, was, of course, changed. Oh, by the way, David Freeman now is, is obviously uh, worried that he might have upset you because he suddenly says, he, I, I remember Mike's father, Horace, oh. uh, teaching maths when I was at City of London School. Oh. I'm a huge fan of you, Mr. Brealey. So, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. so there we are. We, we, we forgive you for pointing out, pointing out the myth of the phone boxes. And yes, the myth of the phone boxes. Um, yeah. Now, so you, and that was, that was the end of your test career then, that, that you, you, you retired from test cricket. Yes. And you have definitely described that as also a blessing um, for you, because as you say, you, you, we're moving now on to, you know, what happens next. But let's just talk about the act of retiring, because um, you, 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 were, you weren't the only one who retired from first class cricket at that time, but most of the others didn't. But, would, but you've talked about the difficulties that cricketers have in retirement and how um, the kind of problems that emerge, which I think you've largely missed, but even, even your colleagues of that period didn't. Do you want to just elaborate a little bit on, on you know, 
you know, to retire at that age is different from how most careers work. Yes, I mean, retire or anything from <clears throat> mid thirties to early forties. In those days, you could go on a, mm. if you're good, uh, someone like Brian Close or Railing was going on into well into their forties. I was forty when I retired, um, which is an advanced age for a cricketer, but not an advanced age for a a doctor or a teacher or a, you know, or many other people, a yeah. businessman or whatever, or, or a plumber or anyone. So, um, yes, I think it's not easy. And I think another thing that's not easy is that there are a few things that people are going to be able to do after playing cricket at a high level or sport as a high level that will match their love for that activity. I mean, people go into cricket, let's, or other games, no doubt, because they love the game. I mean, they also go into it because they're good at it and because they can make a living out of it and so on and so forth, or they hope they can. But um, so when they finish, that's really the end of something that's been very big in the whole of your life and not just in a sort of success way, but in a passion way. And I think it's hard to find, to replace that. Um, so I regard myself as both lucky and, and well prepared for being able to do, make that transition. I mean, we, we know a lot about, you know, the subsequent career of, of many of the men of 81, but presumably uh, looking at that Atherton piece, which is very well worth reading, actually. I mean, not everybody had a, a kind of a happy afterlife, as it were. Did, did you all stay in touch as a group or, or did your past just, you know, was there any bond that was kept you all together? Did you have reunions on July the 20th or every year no, or whatever the date was? There was one this year, but I didn't go to them because I'm, I'm vulnerable for the, I was vulnerable, I still am, I'm oh, yeah. a bit vulnerable for COVID. So I, I couldn't have, even if you'd invited me to have dinner with you after this, to dine out on this, literally, <laughs> I couldn't, I probably wouldn't have come. <laughs> um, well, so, um, that will change. <laughs> well, yes, well, so, um, I think many people who are happiest probably stay in the game because their expertise is known. They can vicariously criticize and praise and live through the next generation of cricketers if they're coaches or commentators or writers or umpires is a very good thing. You know, there's an integrity about mm -hmm. being an umpire. You're trying to get to the truth and you're trying to see things and you're using your specialist knowledge to help you to see accurately. So I think that um, those things are often good things. And I, I, I think that some people, uh, though this may be more to do with my perception than their experience, but some people um, feel, must feel a bit, or must feel, I put it that way, a bit sort of bedraggled, being dragged around to make money by, you know, opening grocery stores or giving speeches at, at uh, cricket dinners or, well, not cricket dinners so much, because there again, you're amongst people who know the game and you're using your expertise. But I mean, being a sort of marketing person, unless you like marketing, then it's fine. But I think if, there, if you're put up on a stage somehow, just because of something you did 20, 30, 40 years ago, um, I think mm. that's a bit disappointing, really. Yeah, I mean, to quote to you, you say, uh, you know, where people don't find the work that fits their skills, which may, you say, which merely makes use of a man's name. Yes. You know, such a man loses their authenticity. It's, it's, well, I think there's a risk quite. of that, yes. There's a risk of yeah. that. Yeah. Now, I said I'd move on, but um, Jeremy Clark, who's a, a well-known psychotherapist, is, is asking, he said, I once asked Atherton about his dreams, and it turned out he had a recurring nightmare about Glenn McGrath. <laughs> so I don't know what that was, but anyway, he said, did, 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 this is obviously a, a therapist type question. Does Mike recall his dreams about that famous series of matches? Um, no, I don't. Um, <laughs> I, I could, I could, uh, I don't. Uh, mm. I do remember a dream which I wrote about uh, in a book about um, a dream I had before um, my first test as captain, when I replaced Tony Gregg, who'd defected to Packer, mm. if you remember, mm. 1977. And this was against Australia at Lords. And um, I had a dream about um, being a, sn a snail in a shell 
and very reluctantly putting my head out of the shell. And I think there was another, another dream which was similar, which was about going on stage and then retreating from the stage or something like that. In other words, I was afraid of the a position that I was, the exposure I was going to get and what was going to be seen and how I was going to be seen and so on. I think that was pretty obvious. Uh, just as Mike Atherton's, okay. dream, Mike Atherton's dream was even more obvious. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was it? Do you know? <laughs> no, the one that, well, I thought you just told me. No, I don't no, know. Do you, do you, oh, you don't know? Okay, no, no, no. 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 Well, okay. Uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Clark, will you tell us what the bloody dream was, please? Otherwise, we, we're not going to get away from that. Okay. Um, mention of Tony Gregg has obviously fired up quite a few people as well. Um, one, one points out you were his vice captain for a while. Yes. And, uh, you're clearly different characters, but how did you, how did you get on? Well, I liked Tony. He was an extrovert. He was um, he was a very good captain. I mean, people would would do things for him and do, play for him, as well as I mean, his tactics were pretty good. I think he. The only thing I felt about his tactics was that he, uh, and I suppose that matched his slightly manic quality, was that he'd swing from attack to defence rather dramatically. I mean, I remember a test match in Calcutta when I was vice captain. And we were doing well in the test match and Derek Underwood had bowled brilliantly and was sweaty and dusty and looked, you know, had been bowling 25 overs or whatever, taken some wickets. Mm. And somebody slogged him a couple of times, you know, against the spin, a late tail ender. And Tony put too many people, I thought, on the boundary straight away. And I remember seeing Derek Underwood at the end of his run up, looking around, seeing all his fielders disappearing to different parts of the ground. And I learned something from that, that the bowlers, when you put fielders, all the fielders on the boundary, or lots of them, the bowlers lose heart because they feel the message is, you don't, they don't think you can get anyone out. All you can do is they get, let, them, let them get themselves out, you know, slog it up in the air or miss a straight one. But you don't have any of your proper containing, aggressive fielders, both the close catchers and the people saving one. So I, I thought that Tony was, but Tony was a good captain and he was very good with me when he came back because, you know, he, he, he supported me completely and gave advice if I asked it and sometimes if I didn't, but in a good way. And he played completely for the team and so on and so forth. So, you know, I had a lot of time for him. Mm. People are getting more interested now in personalities as they would do. So Ashok Roy is, is asking, it's still on the issue of, of I mean, the one thing you, you clearly aren't from talking to you before and what everyone says about you is you clearly aren't, a, a, you don't have a kind of an arrogant swagger and, and style of leadership. Um, but what about, uh, you know, a great cricketer like Richards, Richards, who clearly does, you know, do you think that, do you think all of these things are irrelevant or, or that no, they, they do matter? They matter. Um, <clears throat> I put in the same category, Viv Richards with Shane Warne. Two of the best, greatest mm -hmm. cricketers we've um, we've ever seen, any of us, I think. Yeah. And they both had a swagger, and it wasn't so much an arrogance. It was an arrogance, but it wasn't so much that as this was their stage. This was the stage on which they performed. They and they fully owned that position, and and I think that was conveyed to the batsman. Uh, and you know, Viv Richards could play a forward defensive shot which looked so contemptuous, it almost gave the message to the bowler, you know, if I'd chosen, I could have hit that out of the ground with equal ease. And Shane Warne made the batsman, you know, he made him wait a bit, he did this and that, he made, said a few things probably, and, and he was a great bowler. And, and, and he sort of, he intimidated people, and you know, the people who were afraid of playing him even very good players, and certainly people were afraid of bowling at Viv Richards, didn't know what to do. And uh, so he'd half won the battle before a ball was bowled with some people. Mm -hmm. uh, I, think that, I, I think that's what, what is conveyed. Yeah. Okay, that's a good point. Now, um, uh, and now we're, we're, we're shifting a bit now, but uh, obviously politics and sport always go together. And someone else has asked about the interactions between politics and sports were in, in, in your career, and they're particularly asking about the South Africa tours. Um, this is the Bolivera affair, I think. So, yeah, I presume that's what they're asking about. And where you did, quite early on in your career, take a stance. 
Yes. Do you want to give us a little bit more of the background about that and how that yes. panned out for you? This was in 1968. And, yes, I remember um, that. Yeah. And in 1964, I had gone on the MCC tour of South Africa, as I, I think I said earlier, didn't I? Anyway, as a young mm -hmm. hopeful, yep. with, with Jeffrey Boycott as the other young hopeful, though he was a bit more hopeful than I was and had some cause to be. <laughs> anyway, we, so I went there. I sort of, uh, you know, I, I thought apartheid was um, pretty bad, but I didn't, I hadn't studied it. I didn't know much about it. I, I don't think I'd had any first-hand contact with anyone from South Africa at that time, or if I had, it hadn't concerned apartheid. So I went and stayed on for a few weeks afterwards and traveled around the country, uh, which made me even more opposed to the system. And while I was playing or, or not playing, as the case was in, in that series, I was also meeting people who were uh, Liberal Party members, people who'd been under house arrest, uh, opponents of the government. Um, I met Alan Payton, uh, had lunch with him, who, was, who wrote Cry the Beloved Country. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, admire, admired him very much. He was very quiet, extremely modest. And, you know, he'd written this very fine, polemical novel, you know. And, and yeah, so I, I, I got a bit, more, a bit more radicalized as a result of that, uh, that, that whole tour. And um, then there was the Dolivera affair. And I, I don't know, you know that he, the, the, story, the thing was that he scored 158 against Australia at the Oval in the, in the mm. last test, took a wicket or two, and we won the test match in a very close finish. And two days later, he wasn't selected in the 16 to go on the tour to South Africa, which was due to start in about two or three months time. And it all seemed a little bit fishy to me, or I don't, by fishy, I don't mean that people were consciously determined to keep him out, that there may have been one or two people like that, but that there may be some unconscious bias amongst people who desperately wanted the tour to go ahead for cricketing reasons and who didn't have any particular uh, conviction about uh, about uh, apartheid. So uh, when soon after this, I was contacted by an MCC member who said, can we meet a few of us? David Shepherd was one. Uh, and can we meet and uh, talk about this and see if there's anything we can do? And what we decided to do was to um, ask for a special general meeting of the MCC to, say, to criticize them, not, not just the selection committee, but for not having clarified the situation beforehand. In other words, not having challenged the South African government to tell them whether any team we picked would be acceptable to them. So that, that the players, the selectors would know where they were uh, and you know it, it would be public knowledge. I mean, if they wouldn't accept them, then we wouldn't go. We arranged to tour somebody else. And if they would accept them, we would, and we picked the team we wanted to pick. Um, and I think they knew the answer that they would have got, which is no. But they didn't pursue that. They sort of kept that in the back of their minds. One or two people, I'm not talking about the whole of the members of the MCC or the whole committee or anything like that, but I'm talking about one or two people. And so, and then uh, so I spoke, I seconded this proposal of no confidence when I was 26 uh, to David Shepard's very, very passionate uh, talk. David became a friend of mine. Uh, Is that the David Shepard who was the Bishop of Bishop Rich, Liverpool? Same guy. Yeah. And then of Liverpool, yes, indeed. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he had been much more clear in his radical, radical view before uh, of not being willing to play against or tour South Africa than I have been. So he was in a, a, a stronger position, as it were, morally, to, to take this stand. Though, of course, I don't think I was in a weak position to take the stand. I think I <laughs> changed my views and they developed and so on. So that was the situation. I mean, we lost the vote, but... Uh, and, and then there were arguments in the Cricketers Association. I wasn't altogether popular for this, though it was at a time when I was teaching at Newcastle University and I wasn't playing cricket much, so... I, I, it wasn't as if my future career hung on popularity in the cricket world. I wasn't making a huge sacrifice, but, but nevertheless, it was, ah, okay. it was not appreciated in some quarters. Okay. 
I mean, it's fair to say that the, the true nature of the apartheid regime probably wasn't apparent to many people in, in the UK yes. at the start of the 60s. Yes. It would develop during the decade. Yeah. So what, what happened to Dolly? What, what, what happened to Dolly I mean, that he the tour didn't go ahead. The tour didn't go ahead. He kept uh, quiet. He wouldn't. He, there was a lot of pressure on him. He, there was pressure mm -hmm. on him. He was offered bribes, really, in effect, to, to not go, to make himself not available. He, uh, there were a lot of people on the anti-apartheid movement who think, thought he wasn't courageous enough to speak out against it. He said he's a professional cricketer. He's doing his job and getting on with his work. And uh, he would like to be able to go on the tour if selected. I mean, he kept, he kept a very modest, um, neutral, almost, profile. Mm. But actually, I know that he was very, very angry underneath and hurt okay yeah so I, I do know that and oh uh, uh, oh i mean there's lots more to be said uh, <laughs> i wrote about that at length in in uh, my book on cricket that i wrote a couple of two or three years ago so yeah. we have that we're going to mention in a second so don't worry we're not we've not forgotten that bit either no, now no, no point we, to mention well we we'll definitely want to move on now it, it, obviously um you had so it's obvious from the fact that you had an analyst when you were heading me that um, you were already um, uh, lots of word experimenting. You were already in analysis yes. uh, at that time, which must have been already that must have been extremely unusual. Did, did anybody know? Yes. When, when did you do it before yes, you went me. to the nets or what? Well, before the match. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, I went. I, my analyst, uh, the same woman I phoned from Headingley was uh, very generous to me when I was playing for Middlesex outside London, but not too far away. She'd see me at 6.15 in the morning and I would uh, drive then, finish at 7.05, drive to Brighton or Chelmsford or Basingstoke or somewhere and, and play and then come back and, uh, and then do the same the next day. So, you know, I, I was and, and at Lords. I, I saw her before the before I had to be at Lords for home matches. Well, so, what drew uh, you into that? Well, I, mean, I know you've done philosophy and classics, but really. yes, well, philosophy a bit because there was a teacher who wrote a book called Philosophy and Psychoanalysis, whom I admired very greatly. He had the wonderful name Professor Wisdom, which was a very good name for a professor of philosophy. But he was a, a fine teacher and a, a, a very interesting thinker. And so I, I had an intellectual interest in it. Uh, through him, I read Freud and, or some Freud, and, um, and, he, and he introduced me to a psychoanalyst when I was in my mid twenties and was still doing f philosophy at Cambridge, uh, so whom I met and sort of explored it. So I'd been thinking about it as a possibility for a long time. I joined the Samaritans when I was at Cambridge. And I didn't uh -huh. know why, but um, I think it must have been partly to be in touch with my own neurosis, etc. But also, of course, to help somebody, and, to, and but also to find out what it was like to be with someone who was feeling desperate or depressed or suicidal. And I found two things, at least from that. One was that people didn't readily ring off, so I could listen to them. And secondly, that I was curious to know more. So that was that was one element. Um, um, when I started playing as captain for Middlesex, I didn't have anything particular to do in the winter. I did some adult education teaching, but I didn't have any full time job in the winter, except when I was writing a book to on captaincy for the first three years. Mm -hmm. But um, I got a job working as a nursing assistant in a clinic for adolescents run along psychotherapeutic lines in Hendon, North London, called the Northgate Clinic. And I did that for two periods of six months in the two winters. And uh, that was what really finally uh, decided me that this is what I wanted to apply to do uh, for it. And one of the things I remember about that was there was an analyst at the clinic called Dr. Bird, Donald Bird, who held weekly meetings for the nursing staff, both qualified nurses and the unqualified ones like me, to talk about what, um, what the patients made us feel and to take that seriously as part of the information we got from the patients. And now we would call it counter-transference uh, in analytic terms. Uh, 
uh, and uh, yep. I found that absolutely fascinating. And and you know it helped me with the with the these young people, and I I, I found it really interesting. And so in 1976, which was the just after I finished the second of those winters, I applied to the Institute of Psychoanalysis for training, thinking that I'd play cricket for another two or three years. But as it happened, that was the time that I got picked for England at the age of 34, and my career got elongated, and Middlesex started to do really well and uh, win championships and things. So I played cricket for longer. So I went into analysis as a training an analysis, so I knew I needed it, needed it for my own purposes and for myself um, uh, in, I think, 1978. Um, and, and so for the last four years I played cricket, I was in analysis. I mean, one, one of the Middlesex players said to me when I scored some runs, he said, What's this? What does this woman do for you? This business you go to early in the morning? Because I want one of them, he said. <laughs> he thought I was doing, it was better than coaching, he thought. I'm not saying it always is, but uh, in, that, in this way, but it was, uh, it didn't, it helped me. I mean, I was struggling to find a link actually how to move into that world, but actually, someone's asked a question that gives a perfect link, which is. Maybe someone's asked a question about the future of test cricket and, and, and uh, is the five day day, uh, day uh, game doomed? But of course, both cricket, test cricket and analysis have that in common, that they're out of tune with the world that demands quick results, either in sport or in therapy. Yes. As uh, Jeremy Clark will well know. Uh, and yeah, just, just yeah, wax, wax a bit on that subject, would you, about the power of session uh, does our need for quick results, is that the end of psychoanalysis or test cricket or neither? <laughs> well, I or think, <laughs> I, yes, well, it's a good question. And I don't know the answer. I mean, they're both, the, the, the threats to the game of cricket, I think, come mm. from two sources. One is that children very rarely now play it at school. You know, it used to be, in my, when I was at school, it was cricket in the summer and football in the winter. And, you know, a bit of one or two other things thrown in along the, along the way. But they were the main English sports and they were in schools. And now there's hardly any uh, secondary schools uh, where cricket is played. Very few, except public schools, uh, which is very sad. And there are other efforts to do this. There's an uh, MCC charity and there's Chance to Shine, the MCC Foundation. There's Chance to Shine. Mm -hmm. You're trying to do something about it. But, the you know, the demand for quick results, the demand for... Uh, excitement, the demand for the 100 and the 20 over match, which I like, but which are at risk of pushing out or pushing into a corner test cricket and, and three or four day professional cricket, the long, slow game, which is the biggest challenge to one's skills and personality really uh, are in the game. Mm. Um, so it's getting more and more difficult to find a proper place for them. So that's my worry. And yes, psychoanalysis, psychoanalysts are worried about, um, you know, in some parts of the world, the training is no longer that you have to see people five times a week. You see them three times a week in some places. Um, there's worry that more and more uh, people can't think in terms of that. And not surprisingly in many ways, of course, from the cost point of view and the time point of view. Um, and, you know, so there's a worry. And there's a question, uh, can it still be practiced uh, but less frequently uh, but be used in other ways and I think that's a possibility you know for example I think in hospitals for well if I dare say so to use Simon with, with, with psychiatrists sometimes with nurses with the staff of hospitals and there can be some help given by psychoanalytic thinkers and practitioners as to what unconscious things might be going on in the unit or in their, uh, on their side too. And, and there are the Barlint groups, which are, was, that were set going by a psychoanalyst called Michael Barlint, uh, where therapists or analysts uh, sit with doctors, GPs, I think very often, but not only, mm -hmm. and, they, and they get the GPs to talk about difficult cases or cases that are on their minds. And, and there's a, a, sort of, a sort of interpretive, what is the meaning of this, if one can see it a little further, than meets the first eye, you know? And, and I think people find it gives, it, it sort of 
I think it, one thing it does is it makes the connection between psychosis on the one hand and normality or less severe emotional problems on the other hand, it makes it less absolute. It makes it less of a cliff. Uh, and there's more of a continuity that one can see elements of, of psychotic functioning in all of us, uh, partly, of course, when we dream, but I mean in, in our behaviours, in our thinking, in the way that unconsciously and sometimes partly consciously we go about things. So I think that psychoanalysts, it would be very sad if the, this strange speciality and vocation were to become ar archaic. I, mean, I, I, would, I would agree. Yeah. I, I think you're absolutely right there, and, and, um, and I certainly would agree with that. Uh, and certainly in, in, you know, in, in my career, we worked with uh, psychoanalysts a lot, not so much because of the, you know, the, the, some of the theoretical back and back yeah. behind it, but because when they're good, they're very good, and they seem to encapsulate what is often missing in, in, in many doctors and indeed many psychiatrists, and certainly myself, which is that ineffable thing of wisdom. The good ones that I've worked with had wisdom about people. Yeah. And I don't know if you needed an analytic career, uh, training to do that, but certainly in some, that was what they had in, in a way that no one else had. And they were very, very good at helping you with incredibly difficult, impossible patients. Yes. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And I, th I think in some cases it's true. It's not <laughs> certainly not true in all yes. cases, but in some cases it's true. And I think as with other skills and, and, um, and indeed vocations, there's a, this combination of training and uh, inherent capability or uh, uh, facility. And facility is a strange word with psychoanalysis because you know, if you're too facile, there's something missing. You have to be capable of being disturbed and, and tolerated for a while. As indeed, if you captain the team or lead people, you have to have something of that too, as a matter of fact. When, when we were chatting earlier, I, I mentioned the late Janet Malcolm, who yes. died uh, only a few weeks ago, sadly, and her book, Psychoanalysis, The Impossible Profession, which I'm sure you've read, I think all analysts have. But she makes, and this doesn't apply to you, but it does apply to some of your colleagues, that many analysts do though live in what we would now call a bubble. I don't think they called it that yeah. then, but it is a bubble. Yes. Only interested in what goes on in the Institute of Psychoanalysis and so on, and yes. will only in fact talk to you if you've actually been analyzed yourself. And do you think that's a fair criticism though? Because it, it's, it, doesn't, it clearly doesn't apply to you, obviously, but it does apply to some of your colleagues. I think. Probably a bit. I mean, I, I, I think in, in the book, in Janet Malcolm's book, it, it's mm. described by the person she's having her interviews with about some of the others. And he is obviously feels a bit of an outsider to that group, you know? Um, and he, he goes the other way a bit. He says he doesn't have any friends who are psychoanalysts. <laughs> His wife's a sculptor. They meet people in the arts, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, he yeah, thinks, true. thinks they're boring. So I think that, you know, one, one can go either way. And I, I, I suppose that the... Yes, there can be cliques. And after all, we do, we do quite like, I mean, cricketers get on with other cricketers quite a lot too. And we do quite like people who know what we're talking about without having to explain it too much and don't have too many of the same cliched questions to ask us, you know, if, if we're yeah. doing something yeah. that is interesting to people, or curious, make, makes them curious. Fair enough. And... And, and, and then also you're in your other career as well, that we mustn't ignore at all, is of course you've, you're also a successful author and uh, you, your book, The Art of Captaincy, um, probably your most famous book, and, and it was described as, as uh, canonical in an Australian newspaper only last week, very really? pleased to say. Very and nice. your latest book, yeah, I have here, The Spirit of Cricket. Yes. So, um, yeah. And I, just, and I just want you to... Just wax a little bit again, just just reassociate, as you might say. But it, you, in it, you 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 begin with with the you start thinking about the phrase "it's not cricket," so yeah. something is not cricket. Yes. And as far as I know, we don't say something is not table tennis or yeah. something is not football. That's right. Um, that doesn't make much sense as as a as a as a colloquial phrase. Why why can we still say something is not cricket 
and people would, and we're not talking about cricket, we're talking about something else. Yeah. People would know what you mean. Well, what, why has that come about? Well, to get a full answer, you have to read the book. Well, yeah, buy the book, folks, but give uh, us a shorter answer. <laughs> the short answer, um, I think it's, it's partly got a bit of truth in it, and it's partly another myth. You know, that's what I think. Um, some cricket people would be offended by my saying that. But it's partly that, you know, it used to be the slogan, or, which was had uh, social and probably racist connotations or empire connotations in the 19th century. And, you know, uh -huh. we went out and taught all these people how to be behave, and cricket was the great thing to teach them. And we'd probably, by the way, done classics as well. So you can see I was the pucker little schoolboy <laughs> when I was doing classics and playing cricket. So I think it's a bit of that. And secondly, I think it's that um, there is a sort of, not just from the top down or the social top down, but in park cricket and league cricket and cricket against a wall in, in Yorkshire or in Birmingham or in London or whatever, I think there is a sort of um, a sense of what's right and wrong as well. I suppose there is in almost everything, but there is a, a sense in cricket and there, is, there are traditions such as walking when you know you've hit it and you're caught behind, you know, which is, uh, I, I'm, I'm not completely sold on it. I mean, the Australians don't do that, and, uh, but they can play the game in a perfectly moral way, according to the, their lights, which are also reasonable. They say, well, someone's appealing against me, let the umpire decide and then do what the umpire says without showing dissent. And mostly uh, they do that in a very honorable way. You know, and there have been, of course, Australians who will walk even if they know they've hit it. And in test cricket, I, I don't think many people do walk. They're more now because of the camera being on. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think it's a, mix, it's a mixture of uh, reality and a sort of... Cricket is also such a slow game. It gives you time to think and feel guilty and ashamed afterwards during the match. And wish you hadn't done something dishonorable and other people might indicate it to you and I think it's sort of there's time for those things to be argued about to sink in a little bit you have to tolerate loss in cricket especially if you're a batsman it's like a king dethroned almost before he started his rule you know out for naught if yeah. you walk off the field there aren't many games where you disappear from the field from one mistake or one fine piece of cricket by the opposition so you have to yeah. learn to tolerate things I don't know if that helps I did think it did but then I read by their own hand and the number of cricketers who after they've stopped playing cricket have killed themselves David Frith's book yeah um, but um, I think it can it can uh, lead to this thought it's also a, an individual game within a team game I mean each individual drama is between a batsman and a bowler but it's in the whole context of a team. So it's more like the whole, it's more like, you know, if you're playing tennis, it's just you against somebody mm. else. Uh, but this is more like a family or, you know, you've got uh, as yourself, but there's also other people to think of. So I think it's possible that cricket actually inherently has something, something that inclines one towards the better side. I mean, in the book, you do you examples of, of uh, very famous incidents the Greg Chappell underarm bowling on the last ball incident and things like that interestingly you mentioned that I didn't know this but in the years after that Chappell's claimed that actually he had been um, mentally unwell at the time he claimed that and I don't remember him saying that at the time do, 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 do you think that that's a post hoc justification for a, a ruthless yeah. action or, or just that they're underestimating? I don't know if he used the phrase mentally unwell, but he said he was, he, he, he conveyed that. You're quite right. He conveyed that he wasn't in a fit state to be on the field. He'd actually said yeah. to Rod, Rod Marsh earlier in the day, I'm not feeling at all good. Can I go off? And Rod said, no, you've got to stay on, mate. You've got to stay on. You've got to see us through this and then whatever you do, you know, which is probably mm. what most people would have said at that time. And I think the stigma of, of admitting to mental health problems would have been much greater at that time than now. Mm. And I'm pleased that it's less great now. Yeah, indeed. And, and of course, even 
you know, even a few years ago, several of your colleagues or and all you write about careers have been terminated by mental illness. Yeah, you mentioned Jonathan Trott. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, I don't think he would he would call it mental illness, but he called it anxiety certainly. And and Marcus Trescothic was very much impaired yeah. in what he could do. And it's it was it was um, you know a sign of the times, but also admirable that these people were willing to talk about it, write about it. Uh, yeah, you know, and be, be part I think it to encourage them. Yeah, and another again from the spirit of cricket. I think I think I think I've just lifted this straight from it, but it may be another of your books. But you, you use another example which I rather liked actually of, of sledging, and you use the example of Daryl Cullinan, who was very yeah. distressed, in fact, by Shane Warne. He about. was the one I was thinking about earlier. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And and he and can you remember when he, he he had to take time out of his career to have therapy and when he returned can you remember what Shane Warne said to him no what uh, I see your book okay but his first words were I'm going to send you straight back to that leather couch mate did he so, yeah. yes well uh, yes you know, well, I mean, I, assume a, you were telling the truth. I mean that's another thing about spirit there's a narrow line between fair uh disruption of confidence and mm. unfair sledging maliciousness you know, malignity you know uh, and yeah. uh, when people really do collapse you know if he really did have a collapse shame would have been sorry uh, you know that, he, that he'd said that uh, but mm. and probably true with Jonathan Trott too though they were pretty pleased to get him shaky and not able to play against them <laughs> you know? yeah so t tell us a little bit about the future then. You, you're working on another book, I believe? Yes, I'm working on a book that its provisional title is Turning the Pebble, Pebbles, because it's sort of turning and looking at the other side of things. And it's following, it's a, a little bit like uh, parts of our conversation, Simon. It's following yep. <laughs> uh, not so much the hist my autobiography, but that the arguments and debates and discussions I have with myself and what I got out of different things that have mattered to me in the course of my life, including the things we've mentioned, but also literature, my interest in religion, though I'm not conventionally religious, but I think there's a lot to be got from religion too, and uh, the literature and the theatre and music and nature and how unpractical I am except in playing. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Same as me. Anyway, um, now, oh, oh, and also the, 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 the nightmare, by the way, um, it says he kept seeing McGrath steaming down to bowl and looked down at his bat and realised it was broken. So that, yes. was, that was um, yes. a nightmare, this, a bit like Jeffrey Howe. Yes, I, I used to have one with a, with a rubber bat. My bat had turned to rubber. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Now, don't yeah. go away. Um, but lots and lots of people are asking lots and lots of questions, which we can't do. Um, I will just point out that Martin Dye, I'm sorry, I'm not going to take your question, but I'm going to just mention that uh, you, Mike, you gave him 100 lines at CLS. Oh, at CLS? That must be some school. City of London, yes. No, City of London, yes. Mm. Okay. So he said, but he says, I'm sure I deserved it. So, oh, yeah. and he wishes you best. Now, don't go away. I've just got a couple of little bits of housekeeping to do um, to remind people that uh, next week, we are definitely moving to the other end of the spectrum because uh, our guest is Mr. Noor uh, Wazi uh, Jelani, who's a, a very famous neurosurgeon from Great Ormond Street, who separates out conjoined twins, uh, which is about as far from psychoanalysis as you get. And he also has an MBA and a medical law degree, so he sounds an extraordinary man. Um, tomorrow on our RSM live show, at, uh, I know a lot of you follow at um, half 12, we're doing LGBTQ and COVID with a very strong panel, Paul Martin, Lizzie Streeter and Camilla Kamarudin. And then next week, um, we have a much longer session on the Thursday, and this is about vaccines, variants and infections. Uh, the position this winter, and we have a lineup that will grace Oscars night. We have Dame Sarah Gilbert. We have Sharon Peacock, who many of you who comes regularly to talk about deviants, um, uh, deviants. <laughs> what do I mean? Variants, variants, not deviants at all. That's what you talk about probably sometimes. But, uh, variants and is quite brilliant. And Sarah Walker. So to make up all we're missing from that is Emma Raducanu and we'll have a full house of absolute celebrities. So you have to pay for that, I'm afraid, because it doesn't come for free. Um, but that shouldn't stop you from giving us donations tonight anyway. 
to the RSM to keep this series going. So, Mike, back to you. Back to you. So, Marcus Berkman, the, the author, I don't know if you know him, but he, he writes quirky books on, on, on village cricket and things like that. And going back to Headingley, he, he says that um, the reason why that test will always be in everyone's memory, um, including yours and all of ours, remember that, he said, it's the bedtime story a child prizes above all others, losing none of its potency or wonder in the habitual retelling. Do you, do you think you'll ever get tired of the habitual retelling that you have to do every time someone like me talks to you? Well, I didn't get tired of it today. <laughs> thank it, so thank you. you. <laughs> um, but um, yes, uh, sort of every four, every four years when the Australians come and every 10 years when there's an anniversary, there is, there is, like you said, you know, there's an urge to get some new question or new answer in. You know, yes. that, that's not really going to be possible much longer, put it that way. No. Yeah. No, I it, thought he was going to say it, it remains in, in, in the mind because of the, the sheer bucolic nature of Botham's innings at Headingley. <laughs> true, in, true. A sense, in, a, in a sense, Bob Willis is bowling. You know, the, the, the local fast bowler comes tearing in, bowls as fast as he can, and the ball flies off the glove and hits the wickets, and you know, and there's a narrow win. It's like a, it is like a story, a bedtime. Yeah, but I, and it's also it is it is that great that great story of a complete reversal. It's why everyone's going mad about, you know, Emma, the tennis player at the moment, because it is so utterly, I think the odds were even higher than the odds that uh, Dennis Lilly got it. Uh, it's, uh, it again. She was, yeah. yeah, I think, I think the odds were 5,000 to one for her. I wonder if anyone actually. Well, I think it was 10,000 for one for Dennis. Was it 10,000? Was it? Yeah. <laughs> it was 5, anyway, it was certainly some thousands in each case. Yes. Yes. I, I know. know. It, it, was was it was, it was delightful to see, to see um, this morning, um, Piers Morgan had to eat his hat, which must be a much uh, chewed over appendage, I suspect, and <laughs> apologise for, for his criticisms of her early brilliant. Yeah. Anyway, look, Mike, it's been yeah. a real pleasure to talk to you. And I just want to give you a final quote uh, from, from Mike Atherton's piece on the men of 81 that he wrote on the anniversary. And one thing he says in it, he says, to a man, at least the ones I spoke to, really is always affectionately remembered. And can I say on behalf of myself and also our audience, I can now understand exactly why that is the case. Thank you so much for doing this. Best of luck with your new book and um, come back and tell us all about that when that's ready. And also we look forward to having dinner with you as soon as that's possible. So thank you so much. There's so many questions now, it's just impossible. Um, thank you, Simon. And I've enjoyed it. Thank you to everyone. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure for all of us. Take care. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.